I am not a surgeon. I don't think that's what God wanted me to do to make things better. But he did give me some sense of judgment, temperament, patience, and discipline that enables me to be good at helping Shepherd Resources. Everybody has a role to play, and this is mine. Friends, our guest for today is Thomas Gaynor, the Chief Investment Officer at Markel Corp. He serves on the boards of several organizations, and a recent Wall Street Journal article quoted, every investor can learn something from him. Instead of trying to mimic the inimitable brilliance of Mr. Buffett, maybe more investors should emulate the common sense and patience of Mr. Gaynor. Quoting from a recent chapter in a book about him, Markle's success has made Gaynor rich, but he lives in a simple townhouse and drives a Toyota Prius. I like getting 50 miles per gallon because I'm cheap, he says. <laughs> and if we did not need oil, I think the world would be a better and more peaceful place. By living modestly, he can also give more money to charity. But I don't want to exaggerate, this is not a Mother Teresa-like existence, he says. Friends, I'm personally delighted to be, have him here. We share a common hero in John Wooden. And Tom's letters speak to the spirit of Coach Wooden's definition of success. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our special guest for today, Mr. Thomas Gaynor. Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I know it's sort of a custom and a, and a cliche to say, you know, I'm really honored to be here, and, and I am, that's true. I'm also a bit intimidated, because I, I guess uh, you know, you're all smarter than I am. It's, it must be a rule around here that the dumbest guy has to wear a coat. So uh, <laughs> it, is, it is what it is, and I'll, I'll try to uh, compete as best as I can, uh, but I am a uh, 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 very much honored to be here and very uh, impressed. I mean, what, what you do is known on the world scale, and Markel is a, is a tiny little company com compared to you. We have a, a nice uh, record over a, over a long period of time, uh, but I recognize the, the group that I'm here in front of today, so I'm uh, very honored and privileged to be here. Um, Sarah called me. He attended uh, one of the gatherings we do out in, out in Omaha, uh, where we meet with uh, most of our investors in Markel. Um, and he, he called and asked if I would come and, and give this talk. And of course, I said yes. Uh, so um, I, I agreed to give a talk. But what I really like to do is talk with people, not at them. So uh, I'm going to share a few comments and um, some discussion about investing. But then very much, I hope that you'll start to ask some questions. Uh, and then we can have an interactive discussion, because I, uh, I don't know what's on your mind. So the only way that I really can do that and address the issues and things that you want to talk about are to, to hear them directly from you. So um, the title, when, when Sarab and I were talking about uh, what we should call this talk, would be The Evolution of a Value Investor. And I thought that was a, a good way to try to describe things, because as I look around the, gr the group today, I think in addition to the fact that you're all smarter than I am, you're all younger than I am. Um, and so you have some evolving and learning and some passing through time to do on your own uh, that I've done as well. And perhaps I can accelerate your learning curve a bit uh, in that process and speak a little bit about my own story of how I evolved and the things that have changed over time uh, for, for me as an investor. So the way it begins, my, my technical training is that of an accountant. I'm a, I'm a CPA uh, professionally. My father was an accountant, and that was what my, my degree was in. Um, and I, I always uh, tell people when they're sort of trying to figure out what it is they want to do, among the things that would be a reasonable choice for what you're, what you're studying would be accounting. And people ask me, why, why accounting? And I said, well, if you were going to go to Germany and you wanted to be a successful person in, German, in Germany, what would be the very first thing that you should do? And my answer is, you should learn German, uh, because that is the language that people are going to communicate in and work in in Germany. So if you want to go to Germany and be a, su su a success of any sort, I think it would be very hard to do that without having a working knowledge of German. Well, similarly, in business, 
and by business, let's translate that uh, further to investing, the language of business is accounting. So to understand what's going on, uh, you don't need to be a CPA, but I think it's very important to have a rudimentary knowledge of what accounting is and how it works and what uh, words and numbers mean when they're in the context of financial statements and business and the, the language of accounting. So that's how I started. And um, similar to, I think, many people as they begin to go down the path of trying to become an investor, I, I had a very strong quantitative bias in selecting investments. And one of the ways I would describe that, and I think uh, um, one of the tendencies that we all have, especially when we're starting out for a variety of reasons, is to have quantitative metrics that you really can rely on. And one of the reasons that that, that would be the case is you know, when you're starting out and you haven't done this a whole lot, you really like to have some confidence supplied by something external that you're on the right path. And if you can do uh, some well-established, well-trod paths of disciplines, of things that have worked, boy, that seems like a pretty good basis to make a decision and to think about what's going to happen in the future. And there is absolutely nothing in the world wrong with that. I encourage that. That's, that's really the best way to start. But I think that is only a partial step along the journey of becoming an accomplished uh, investor. And that, 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 um, that worked spectacularly well for, for Ben Graham in the 1930s, who's the, the grandfather of all investing and the, uh, the professor who really taught Warren Buffett uh, the disciplines of investing. But that was a period of time when we were just coming out of the Depression, and there were a lot of securities that were mathematically and quantitatively cheap. So it was a, it was a great technique, a great discipline. It had not been practiced, but that, that pond has gotten a little overfished. Uh, so, so today, while it's important to know the technical skills, to know the accounting, to know things like uh, the, the networking capital and to think about price earnings ratios and price to book value ratios and have these series of quantitative metrics that would tell you that something is cheap, that's good as far as it goes, but it doesn't tell you enough. There are more things. And I call the notion of doing that sort of work, which is the first step, and you really should do it, uh, that's the idea of spotting value. So you see, it's, it's, it's a picture. The time um, stands still when you're looking at a picture of something that you think is worth this, and it's selling for this. So there's a price gap there, and you want to buy it at this, and you think it'll get to that. And that, that's great if it works, but that's a, that's a picture. What I have evolved to, and the path that I've been on for a long time, and, and the reason I got on that path is because I found that uh, that notion of spotting value and thinking that those value gaps would close right after I showed up to buy some stock, it didn't work. <laughs> so it's not as if I found that uh, technique and I learned that and it worked and produced great wealth. It didn't. So you got to take the next step and try to figure something else out. So I moved from spotting value to spotting the creation of value. Value creators as opposed to value spotters. So instead of a snapshot, instead of a picture, how about a movie? What's this movie going to look like? How's this real going to unfurl over time? So instead of saying that I firmly believe that something is worth this, I'm now asking myself, well, what will it be worth next year, and the year after that, and the year after that, and the decade after that? And to have some sense of something that is increasing in value over time at an appropriate rate, well, that's what I'm really hunting for. And that's what I'm, I'm really trying to, trying to find and spot. Um, and I think this um, has applications not just for investing, but for leadership, for management, for relationships that you would have on a social as well as a professional uh, basis. So it, it, it's, uh, it's an integrated thought as to, to how my life is un unfurling. Uh, so with that sort of thought in mind, I came up with a, with a four-point view of what it is that I'm specifically looking for and how I specifically think about things that I might invest in. So the first thing that, that I look to invest in is a profitable business with good returns on capital. It doesn't use too much leverage to do it. And again, each and every one of those words uh, came about because I made a mistake somewhere along the line. Things did not work. And as a consequence, it was a hard, searing lesson when I lost some of my own money. And as Arab said in his introduction, I'm cheap, and I really hate losing money. Um, so <clears throat> hard, hard lessons uh, are learned of the kind that, that's, that sink in and, and sear most deeply. So the profitable business with good returns on capital. Now, uh, we live in a part, you live in a part of the world here 
where there are a lot of dreams, a lot of venture capital things, where people will describe things that are going to happen someday. And a lot of that does come true, especially around here. Uh, this is a, a vibrant community, and this, this place stands as a testament to sometimes there are people who have an idea about something that has never been done before, and we're going to do it, and it'll be spectacular. And that does happen sometimes, and it's, it's marvelous when it does. But I don't know how to do that. So I'm not a venture capitalist. It's a legitimate uh, discipline, but that's not what I am good at. So I like to see, a hist uh, you know, in Virginia, uh, we joke about uh, once, when, once you do something twice, it becomes a tradition. So then you have to keep doing it unless uh, there's some reason not to do it. So Virginia might have a different sort of sense about history than, than what might be the case here and thinking about things that were in the past as opposed to the future. So I like to see a demonstrated record of profitability. Now, the other reason that I like to see that, in addition to just my own limits and not having the skills to see into the future as well as some others do, is that if you think about what a business is designed to do, um, and, and it, it is to serve others. So the most successful business you will ever find is one that the customers are glad they're doing business with you. Uh, because that means their lives are getting better. There's some value that is being created for the customer, not for the business, but for the customer because of that company being in business. And the mark of the business doing that well is a profit. Because if you have a business that is not making a profit, that means one of two things is the case. A, the business is either is doing something that the world just doesn't really care about. People don't need it. People don't want it. For whatever reason, uh, it's, not, it's not getting the, the, the recognition or demand in the, in the marketplace such that the business is able to do all the things it needs to do and still have a margin of profit left over. So that's of no interest to me uh, because in order to invest and invest successfully, a business needs to be able to have profits to pay dividends, to pay its employees, to, to, to grow and, and invest over time. Uh, so I want to see a profit there. The second reason that a business might not be profitable is that they're not very good at it. So uh, I don't know how much anybody is interested in sports around here, uh, but you know, I I'm a Washington Redskins fan, and I hate to admit that because they're not very successful, but uh, neither are the Oakland Raiders, <laughs> you know, which are very close uh, here. So those two teams are sort of uh, decade-long competition for what the worst team in the, in the NFL is going to be. And, and I can't believe that they make that they do. Uh, which is kind of surprising, but, but think about that as a business that uh, if you had a business that was consistently at or near the bottom of, of, of things, you would not think that that is a very good business. And as a consequence, how can that be a very good investment? If I really want to uh, give some of my hard-earned capital to that business and think that I'm going to get more of it years later, uh, I want that business to be successful. So uh, that, that's why I look for businesses that uh, are profitable and earn good returns on capital. And I, and I add the part about leverage because, again, from mistakes, uh, in the 2008-2009 financial crisis, uh, I had some tough losses. Uh, and again, I think you learn more from things that don't go well than when things do go well. Um, and I looked at some businesses that I did not really appreciate how much leverage was inherent in what they were doing. So if you have financial leverage, you might have a very good business. You might be taking care of your customers. You might be serving them well. They might be happy uh, to do business with you. But you might have to refinance your debt and have capital uh, resupplied to you at a time when the markets just don't want to give it to you. And if you're in that situation, basically, I mean, that's like being a card player and you got, you got some really good cards in your hand, but somebody just comes and rips the cards out of your hand before you can finish playing the hand. And I've seen that happen firsthand. I've had gobs of flesh taken from me, uh, figuratively, not literally. I still got my gobs of flesh. Uh, but uh, I've seen that. So as a consequence, I've become very sensitive about leverage and not having too, mu too much uh, leverage. Uh, there's also another factor of leverage, and that is character. And I'll segue into the, my second lens in a bit. Is in, and I can remember when, when Markel first started down the path of buying uh, non-insurance businesses and expanding the, what we did, uh, there was one elderly gentleman who gave me a, a spectacularly good piece of advice. And he said, if you're looking to buy businesses, don't buy businesses where they use a lot of debt. And I wondered why. And he said, well, you know, if you want to make sure you're dealing with high quality, high integrity people, generally speaking, high quality, high integrity people don't use a lot of debt. Or n not so much that, but if, if you were a bad person, if you were uh, sort of a, a little bit of a crook or had a little bit of larceny in your heart, it's unlikely 
that you would use 100% equity finance. Because when it's equity finance, that means it's your own money. When it's debt, you're running your business on other people's money. And he says, crooks don't steal their own money. They steal other people's money. <laughs> so when you see a business that, that sort of relies on a bunch of debt to, to operate and be successful, um, that adds a layer of concern or diligence that you have to do, that you have to think about, uh, that you don't have to if you look at a business that just doesn't use very much debt. So it's a margin of safety. That's a word that, uh, and a phrase that Ben Graham used quite a bit in thinking about investing, uh, that um, by, by looking at companies that don't use much debt, uh, that, that just really protects your downside and protects you from bad things happening. The second lens that I look at anything through is the management. And the management teams that are running the business, I, I'm not running these businesses that either we invest in as shareholders and buy stock in, or that, that we buy that we're uh, majority owners of or 100% owners of. I mean, there are people who are running these businesses. And those people will make those businesses the success or failure that they're uh, doomed to be. And when I'm looking at people, I'm looking for two attributes. One is I want um, character, integrity, and ability, two things, character and, and, and um, um, the ability. Because one without the other is worthless. If you have people who have um, high integrity, they're good character people, but they're not very talented, well, they may be nice people. You may like them. They may be good friends, good neighbors, good coaches of your, of your kid's soccer team, things of that nature. But in the context of business, they can't get the job done. So as a consequence, that doesn't do you any good because the business does have to be profitable to continue to persist and grow and last over, over long periods of time. So, uh, um, you know, you got to see that talent there. Uh, the, the, the character is nice, but it is not sufficient in and of itself. If you have people who are talented, who are whip smart, who are very skilled at what they do, but yet have a character or, or an integrity flaw of some sort, well, they may do well, but you as their outside, silent, non-controlling partner are not. That will not end well. Um, and again, this talk is, uh, I'll get to your questions in just a, just a few minutes, I sure will. Um, you know, th that's not just about picking stocks, that's about relationships. So if you were picking a spouse or a partner in a venture, anything like that, uh, to see both of those features in place in large enough quantities that you have confidence that you're dealing with people of character and integrity and talent, that's an, that's an important uh, thing to look for. In fact, I can't think of anything that's, that's more important. So the third bit, and I'll go through four bits, uh, four lenses, and then, and then we'll start opening the floor for questions. The third thing that I think about when investing in anything is what are the reinvestment dynamics of a business? And that's a, a somewhat complicated way of, of saying things, but what I mean is, and uh, Sarah is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, and we were chatting about this earlier, so Ben Franklin was the founder of Penn, and he's sort of the revered figure of the, of the Penn Quakers. And Ben Franklin said, money makes more money, and the money money makes makes more money. Uh, so he, he intuitively understood the power of compound interest. Einstein said it was the most powerful force in the universe, compound interest. Einstein further went on to say that those who understand compound interest earn it, and those who do not understand it pay it. So what is the reinvestment dynamic of a business? What's the compounding feature? And one of the ways you can think about that is think about the restaurant business. Um, in a spectacular five-star gourmet, lovely restaurant, typically those tend to be owned by the people who are there every day. Uh, there are not chains of the best restaurants in, in the world from sort of a gourmet perspective. Usually the owner is the chef or right there at the front of the house and he's there all the time. So that business that restaurant can be very successful, but typically that is not a model that is set up to be able to replicate it again and again and again and again and again. It may provide a very nice living for the, the owner and their family uh, and employ their, their family and, and great service to the, to the world, great food, great prices, all that sort of stuff, but it's not replicable. So there are some businesses that you'll see that are, that are like that, that are boutiques in, in some form or fashion. It's a limiting factor to really be able to apply capital and see it grow. There are other businesses, and uh, you know, it's in the news these days, and people may wonder whether their time has passed, and I won't uh, enter into that debate, 
but clearly this would be an example of, of uh, where somebody was able to figure out a restaurant model that was replicable and able to be done over and over and over again, but go back in time 50 years and, and the, at the start of McDonald's um, and then another McDonald's and another McDonald's and another McDonald's, one right after the other. That's a perfect example of where that reinvestment dynamic kicks in. So when I'm looking at something, I'm thinking, how, how big can this be? How scalable is it? How replicable is it? Because in order for you to really apply a bunch of capital to it, it has to be something that you can keep reinvesting in. And if, if you think about things in a spectrum, uh, and I would encourage you to always think about things in more than one dimension and in a spectrum, things, generally speaking, are not binary. They're not yes or no. They're not white or black. They're, they're shades of gray all the way along the line. Um, so a perfect business is one that earns very good returns on its capital and can take that capital that it makes and then reinvest that and keep compounding it at the same sort of r rate year after year after year. That's the North Star. That would be the absolute perfection. The worst kind of business is one that doesn't earn very good returns on capital and yet seems to need gobs of it all the time. And again, this might be old data because the world seems to change, but I used to joke that airlines fit that, fit that category. So, you know, there were all these airlines and the airlines were always coming and going uh, and people always seemed to want to get into business, but they never really made good returns on capital. These days they are, whether they will continue to do so or not. I don't, I don't know, but that's, that's kind of the spectrum of business. So I just try to get as close to this end of the spectrum as possible. Now, in the real world, this does not really exist very often or very frequently, and oftentimes it's very richly priced when you see it. But how close can you get to it? Because the second best business in the world is one that earns a very good returns on capital. It can't reinvest it, but the management knows that. They're intellectually honest that they, they, they have to do something else with the money. And what are their choices? Well, they can make acquisitions, they can pay dividends, they can buy in their own stock, but they're, they're thoughtful and they know that. And Berkshire really is the best example of a company that, that had that in place where you had the genius at the top who knew that the original business, which was a textile business, um, you know, whatever money that made, it was best to invest that somewhere else and that's what uh, Buffett has done for, for 50 years is to reinvest the cash flows of the various businesses that, that, come in, that feed into Berkshire in other places. So that, that is the maestro-like effect that he has had uh, at Berkshire. So that's a legitimate way of handling the notion that you can't reinvest in the business that you have, uh, but you can be thoughtful about what you do with that money when it comes in. And then the fourth and final lens is price, valuation. And that's really where a lot of people start in investing because there are books you can read, there are spreadsheets that you can do, there are well-trod paths you can follow that talk about what's a reasonable price earnings ratio, or what's a reasonable price to book ratio, or what's a reasonable dividend yield, all of these quantitative factors. And those are all good, but as I said, they're, they're not enough. Uh, they go into the thinking, they go into the thought process of whether uh, this is a good investment or not. But the mistake that I, that I see, there's, there's two types of mistake you could make when you're doing your valuation uh, work. One is that you, uh, you, know, you, you, you pay too much for something. So you make this judgment about what something is, is worth or uh, you make an error in those calculations and you pay more than something is worth. And that, that's, a, that's a frustrating error, but you've laid out some money and it doesn't really earn much of a return or less of a return or maybe even loses money compared to what you paid out for it. That's not the worst thing that's ever gonna happen to you. That is a, that's a, an error that you can recover from. The kind of errors that, that are harder and that really cost you more, although it's a hidden cost and it's an implicit cost, is that you thought about what something was worth and you thought about what you wanted to pay for it and this was something that actually did compound and you never bought it because it never met your test of valuation but it just kept on compounding over time. That example, uh, it's easy not to talk about it. Um, and, and I think if there's, there's one thing that uh, uh, I've been thinking about a lot recently is, you know, as human beings, we tend to have very vivid memories of things that we did and things that happened to us, and especially that happened to us recently. We tend to not have vivid memories and not do well about thinking about the things that didn't happen to us or that we didn't do. And we, we can we can brush away those experiences relatively easily 
because we don't have firsthand experience with it. So we probably all have stories about something, and the older you get, the more stories you will have like this, where you thought about something, or you thought something might have been a good idea, or you thought that might have been a good business, or you thought that might have been a good stock at a certain point in time. But for whatever reason, pricing or whatever, you didn't buy it at that time. And, th and then you never got around to buying it. Uh, those are the things that really hurt. And that money that you didn't make will, will end up being a far bigger subtraction from your theoretical end net worth than, than the things that you did buy that perhaps did not work as, as well as you, as you hoped they would. Uh, so those are the four points and the four lenses of how I think about uh, investing and, and how I've learned to think differently than the way I thought when I was first starting out as an accountant as very quantitatively driven, as very uh, disciplined about sticking to certain metrics that I thought were markers of, of, uh, of valuation. Um, and I've started to think more qualitatively. And if there was one of those four, that's the one that I would think about the most, it would be the third point, the reinvestment. What will happen over time to this business? Will it get better? Will it get worse? Is, are the conditions behind it improving? or deteriorating, and it's a tough world. It's tough, it is very tough to find things that you have confidence in uh, that would continue in, in your best judgment to continue to compound in value over time. But when you do, <laughs> don't be a penny pincher, and I'm as tight as they come, uh, but don't be a penny pincher when you find uh, businesses like that. So, so with that, I, I wanna stop and, and start taking some questions, and I know, sir, you did. So you mentioned uh, evaluating management. You think about character and right. integrity. Uh, first question is, how do you actually specifically evaluate that? And for us that are, you know, can't actually interact with the management of companies, and we just look at prices and stuff like that, how do you, how do we actually go sure. about figuring that out? Well, again, um, I'm, I, I'm looking around the room and I'm seeing that I'm older than you guys, but I'm married and I've been married a long time, just by show of hands. How many people here are married? All right, a bunch of you. Um, how did you decide who you were gonna marry? You dated, and what's the point of dating? It's not really to see a movie, or go to a restaurant, or a ball game, or roller skating, or whatever you did. It's really to spend time with somebody to see if their values overlap enough with yours that you'll be able to get along for a long period of time. That's the whole point of dating. And with management teams and people running businesses, in effect, what, what I'm doing is, is analogous to the idea of dating, is to try to find people running these businesses where our values, at least in the worlds of commerce, overlap enough that I'm happy for them to have the responsibility and the authority to run that business as they see fit. Now, you, you mentioned a limitation that you suggest that I'm able to you know, get an appointment and see people who run business and, and, talk and interact with the managers, and to some degree that's true. But at the same time, uh, I really spend a lot more time reading about people and using the exact same resources that you would have access to as well. So I read the annual reports. I read the proxy statements. I read magazine articles, and I try to think and just sort of look whether and, and get a, a, a gut feel and make some um, judgment and discernment about whether these people are acting in a way that's reasonable and, and makes sense to me. And your calibration is going to be somewhat different than mine. You're, you're just different. I mean, all of us are going to set those things that we think are important uh, and, and where we think the bounds of behavior uh, should be differently because we're all different. But you have them, uh, and I encourage you to think about things in that dimension because one of the things you'll find is you'll make a judgment. Your judgment will not be perfect, but by virtue of the times you get it wrong and you make an error, you, you'll learn something. You'll say, ooh, I don't like that so much. Um, and that'll be a marker to you that the next time you see it, uh, you'll be sensitized to it and it'll help you make better judgments. Um, in, in, in looking at, uh, <laughs> at you guys, um, when I first started in the investment business, I had a very wonderful mentor named Ned Reynolds. And this was a gentleman who was probably 70 years old and I was brand new in the investment business. And he was a very interesting character and uh, it's not like he was formerly my mentor, he was just, he was nice, he was kind, and he was just helpful to people. 
And one day I happened to be standing next to him on a hot summer day in Richmond, Virginia, and uh, not much going on. Or just sort of the market was open. And uh, in those days, you didn't have the CNBC with the ticker tape, but you actually had a physical ticker tape in a brokerage office. So it would create this sort of hum and drone of this tape going by. And he was standing there, and he had his arms folded like this. And he really wasn't engaged in conversation with me. He was standing by my side, was not making eye contact. But I had been in the business all of three months at this point. And he said, Tom, the secret to success in investing is lasting the first 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a powerful statement. Because what he said is, everything you see in the world of finance, you will see again. And every excess that you, that you see happen, and, and every sort of excess of not just overvaluation, but undervaluation. So like the 08, 09 period when we had a real financial crisis. Uh, I suspect, and I hope, that that's a once a generation kind of event. I don't think we'll go through that again real soon. Because all of us who lived through it in a firsthand way have had a taste of that. And we don't want to do it again. So, uh, and, and anybody who hasn't had that happen to them, they, they think it can't. But you just sort of have to, to have to live through it. There's an old joke that says, every generation is the one that thinks that they invented sex. <laughs> Not so. <laughs> but everybody has that sense about them as they go through this path. And, and once you've sort of been around for a while, you, you sort of see things and you recognize things. And, and making those judgments about uh, the character and the values and the way people behave in a way that uh, works for you. That's just a, a process of, of trial and error, with the emphasis on error, and you, and, you, and you get to it eventually. And you don't need, in the, in the, you know, if we're talking about selecting stocks or buying stocks or buying investments, you don't need to have a personal relationship with the CEO in order to make a reasonable judgment about whether you think that company is being run well or not. There's a good paper trail and a good set of, of, of evidence out there for you to, to think about and, and draw judgments about. Um, my question is, how do you feel about investing in companies in rapidly changing industries? So versus like a brand name company like Coca-Cola? It's harder. Uh, it's, not, it's not right or wrong or better or worse. It's just harder. Uh, so for instance, one of the things that's underappreciated is that, um, and Sarab and I were talking about this yesterday, so on his desk in his study, he had a book of uh, the Graham and Dodd Security Analysis, which is the equivalent of the Bible for, for security analysis. Everybody has to study Graham and Dodd if you're going to be in this business. And I noticed on the cover it said sixth edition. And uh, I said, well, I don't know what the sixth edition is like. When I was in school and I was studying it, it was the fourth edition. And I can remember on the 50th anniversary of the class or something, they came out with a reprint of the first edition. And just for grins, I, I bought it. Uh, and I said to Sarab, I said, you might want to get a hold of that first edition because the difference between the first and fourth, it's an entirely different book. So in the first edition, which is really the one that I would recommend that you read, and it, it might sound antique when they're talking about railroads and all those kinds of old businesses, but the concepts. I mean, Ben Graham was a, was a classicist as, as much as he was a finance guy. And he was talking about uh, you know, Greek and Roman uh, civilizations and Greek myths and all, all that sort of stuff, which are really about uh, human nature um, and, and values. And so all this, uh, sorry for the long answer to make a point, but people jump on Ben Graham, and they think about all his qualitative statements that he made. And when, when somebody says a Graham and Dodd style investor, typically that is someone who is, uh, that has come to mean someone who's tearing apart a balance sheet and is a value spotter and finding a difference in, in the price. But Ben Graham, in the first edition, said that growth, which is your point about rapid technological change and things that are changing, and you're, you're implying changing for the better. <laughs> But you have to admit that also sometimes things can and do change for the worse. Um, growth is extremely important. It's just hard to calculate. And it, it's hard to value that. Ben Grimm further went on in the, in the uh, book that he wrote that's just a little more approachable and not so much uh, uh, technically detailed as security analysis, but the intelligent investor, which he meant to write just for 
anybody who wanted to pick up should be able to, to read that book. In, in, in one of the uh, later editions of The Intelligent Investor, Ben Graham made the point that he made more money in Geico, in the stock of Geico, than in every other investment he made combined. Because Geico was the growth company. That's the one that got that third point about the reinvestment dynamic right. And if you further went on and did some research and, and sort of uh, researched that decision about how he got to be connected with Geico and how he got a hold of that big back, uh, block of Geico stock, uh, he relied on his partner, Jerry Newman, to, to make the final deal with the family, the Goodwin family, to buy that stock. because he, he, he did not get that over the finish line himself. <laughs> He, had, he, had str he struggled with that because it wasn't the classic sort of investment that he was used to. Uh, but it ended up being, he says, if it wasn't for Geico, you would never know my name. So um, that idea of, of growth, of rapid technological change, of changing the world, of, of all those sorts of things where you have a, I mean, this is a classic example of something that did not exist not that long ago. And, and now it's one of the leading dominant companies in the world. I mean, all you need to do is get that right once in your whole life and it'll change your investing career forever. But it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to do that. Thank you, Tom, for your visit here. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, so one thing Seth Klarman mentions is uh, being in the investment business, having the right structure, um, the right kind of clients. And one thing that Markel has it uh, rightly structured is similar to Berkshire, permanent source of capital. Would you mind sharing your story of how you came about uh, at Markel um, from your prior career? How was the transition? How did, um, sure. seems well, like a dream job for most yes, people. Yes, indeed so, thank you. I appreciate the question. And I, I think you know a lot of the reason you're here today is because you have personal interest in investing. So I'll actually connect that notion of structure uh, at the end of the answer to, to what might be applicable to you as individuals and in, individual investors. So um, just a, a short snippet, as I said, I, I started out in accounting. And my, and my father was a CPA, and he, uh, we were in a small town, and he uh, had a tax practice, and he owned a liquor store, and he had a farm, and did real estate deals. So I thought that's what accountants did. Uh, but then I went to work for PricewaterhouseCoopers, and it was a little more structured and not quite as entrepreneurial as what I remembered my, my, my father doing. And as an accountant, I always joked that I was more interested in dollars than numbers. And there's a profound difference between the two. So uh, I... I, I just by accident, I had always been interested in the stock market and investing, something my dad and I talked about when I was a kid. Um, so I found a broker in Richmond, Virginia, where I was, who was also an ex-accountant, and he worked for a, a firm called Davenport & Company of Virginia. And he had uh, two hats that he wore. He was an analyst, so he covered companies and wrote research reports for the firm. But he also had individual clients. Um, and I got referred to him. He became my broker. We got along. Um, and then after a relatively short period of time, he extended a job offer to me. He said, you know, you look like you know what you're doing here. <laughs> How'd you like to come over here and, and work with me and we'll, uh, we'll be analysts and be brokers and do investing? And I said, well, that sounds like fun. So I went there and, I was, and that was 1984. And from 84 through 1990, I was at Davenport um, and had those, those two roles. Well, in 1984, that's when I read an article in Fortune magazine about Berkshire Hathaway and about Buffett. And to, just to tell you how stupid and naive I was at the time and just trying to shake it off as best I can, I remember reading that article and thinking to myself, wow, every word just dripped common sense. Um, so I went into the guy I was working for at the time, different, different guy than my partner, but I said, uh, hey, Joe, have you ever heard of this guy, Warren Buffet? <laughs> And he said, it's Buffett, you idiot, and threw me out of his office and whatnot. And I, I saw Berkshire Hathaway. Um, and I was so stupid that when I looked at the price, and it was $380 a share or something like that, I, I said, no stock could possibly be worth that kind of money. So I didn't buy it to my everlasting regret. But life has a way of teaching you these painful lessons and things working out. So in 1986, Markel went public. And it happened to be headquartered in Richmond, Virginia. And there was, and they had an insurance business that uh, made underwriting profits. And Steve Markell, who was the chief financial guy at the company, was interested in investing the underwriting profits longer term in equity securities, in ownership of business. So light went off for me that that, I mean, I missed the first part of Berkshire, but 
at least I was being given a second chance that, no, here's a company that has the same structure, the same architecture, not the same accomplishments, but at least the same theory of having an insurance company as the base engine and using the profitability of the insurance company to provide capital to, to make other investments over time. So, aha, so I bought some Markel stock and from 1986 through 1990, I was covering Markel from Davenport. In 1990, Markel did a deal which more than doubled the size of the company. Steve Markel had been managing investments by himself and thought he might like a partner. Said something to me about coming out there with him. And I said, well, that sounds like fun. And that was 25 years ago. So I've been there ever since. And the day I walked in the door, so he gave me $2 million to manage. Uh, and the total pot at the time was roughly $50 million. That was all there was. Uh, today, uh, the total balance sheet is uh, 20-some billion dollars, and we, we sorry I mentioned the, the four and a half billion. That's the equity investment that we have. I'm actually the chief investment officer, so I'm responsible for the fixed income side. So the, I'm responsible for the whole thing, which is 20-some billion dollars, and that has been grown largely organically with a couple of acquisitions along the way. So it's, it's been a good ride. That's how I got there. And you're correct. One of the beautiful things about being at Markel is it has been a profitable insurance company all the way along. I mean, there have been some years where they didn't make profits, which is normal in years of heavy-duty catastrophes. We're going to lose a little bit of money on the insurance side, but not much. Um, but more often than not, the insurance company has been profitable and has been putting money into the account. And then we can apply those four lenses, those four disciplines that I spoke of in selecting equity securities uh, and been compounding value that way. And really, so, so for instance, the day I showed up and the stock was 8 bucks, and now it's 800 if you do the math in, in broad brush rough terms, roughly half of that has come from cumulative profitability of the insurance operations, and half of it has come from investing that money. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a mutually supportive sort of deal. Now, connecting that to you individually, the great advantage you have individually is that you're investing your money. It's your money. And you don't have a board of directors looking at you or uh, other people, I mean, other people might criticize what you're doing or second guess what you're doing, but they have no authority over it. It's your money. It's your decision that you get. And if you live within your means, you know, you have income of this and you're spending this, you have excess cash flow. And that excess cash flow, you get to invest personally, and you get to invest it for your own time horizon, your own purposes, for as long as you want. Um, and that, that's, that's, a, that's the exact same structure that I get to live in. So I don't have to uh, solicit clients that may take their money away at inopportune times. And if you look at the studies which talk about you know, sort of the average return of mutual funds over a long period of times is X. The average return of investors in mutual fund is a fraction of that. Well, why? It's because when you have a market that's like this and it's going up, people put money in. And when it's down like this, they take money out. So whatever the, whatever the base rates of return are, by their behavior, they make them worse. And fortunately, in our company, we're structured such that we try to take that notion off the table. We're, we're pretty much always investing, whether the market's doing this or this or this. We're just steady pounding away at it and compounding it. And you can do the same thing as an individual if you're, if you're living on less than what you make. And I think about... You know, one of the great wise people of all time is Charlie Munger. And if you think about his example, you know, we all know who Charlie Munger is now. He's 92 years old. And think about sort of his whole life. And he started out as smart as anybody you'll ever know. No. Um, he was an attorney. I think he had seven children, if memory serves. They all went to private school. That's a lot of overhead. <laughs> so I suspect, given a very pleasant personal lifestyle, Charlie Munger was not a billionaire when he was 30 years old, or 25 or 35. But cumulatively, Charlie Munger always, somehow or another, lived on less than what he earned. So he was creating cash flow that he was able to invest. And um, intrinsically, and talking about John Wooden and having an internal versus an external uh, scorecard, Charlie Munger didn't care what other people thought of him. Still doesn't. Didn't then, doesn't now. <laughs> and and uh, so as a consequence, you know, just, just think about this from a definition point of view. If you are living on less than what you are making, you are rich. 
period paragraph. I'm not saying that in a relative term to what other people might be making or not making. Compared to your needs, compared to what you're able to do, you are rich because there's a margin there. You have more than what you need by virtue of choices that you've made, making those kind of choices. Well, if you keep doing that and you're as smart as Charlie Munger, or at least you're, you're, you're smart enough to know that he is a wise person and you should try to be as much like him as possible, well, that gap every year of positive cash flow, investing, making a positive return over time begins to compound. And, and if you graph it on a piece of, not, log, not a log graph, but a regular uh, graph, you know, it'll hockey stick somewhere along the way. So live on less than what you make, invest it reasonably, and live a long time. <laughs> and yeah, and, and that's a, it's a formula that can't not work. And, and you were kind enough, and I'll just tell you one more personal story. So I remember as a kid, the, one of the things that sort of got me hooked on this notion of compound interest and compound returns, and I can, I can remember this vividly even today. So there was this commercial, and it was about savings and loans, you know, which hardly don't, uh, hardly even exist anymore. And it was this uh, picture where you, you only got to see this shot from, from here down. So you would only see this hand. And, and so there was this hand, and it had $50 bills, and it was pointing out... Uh, you know, if you put $50 a month into your savings account and it showed this, this you know, pile being created with people putting these $50 bills on it, it was growing. It said, you know, after seven years or whatever, you'll be able to take out $50 a month forever. And the pile you were taking it away from was bigger than the pile that you had started with. I mean, I might have been seven or eight years old, but that a light bulb went off for me about just the notion of, of compound interest and what compounding meant in a, in a, in a gut visceral sense that I want to, I want to figure something out about that. <laughs> that seems, that seems pretty cool. So, uh, as an individual structurally, as long as you can live on less than what you make, you have every advantage of what Berkshire had, what Markel has. I mean, there is no better structure, uh, where the odds of success are higher. Now, Again, this company stands as testament to there are certain times when something happens that just is out of the blue. And I call that catching lightning in a jar. You know? And that's what Google did. And that's what gets done around this part of the world on a regular basis. But catching lightning on a jar, catching lightning in a jar, that's really hard to do. And it is really hard to repeat and, and to make that process consistent over year after year after year after year, which is much of the challenge, I suspect, when you go back to work that you're tasked with, <laughs> is how to catch some more lightning in jars. It's hard, it's hard to do. Uh, hi, so my question relates to uh, companies that are staying private uh, for longer than it used to be. Like for example, Uber is worth like 40 billion or 50 billion dollars in market cap and it's still private. And like Airbnb is like, worth more than 10 billion, it's private as well. So are you worried about missing this like, huge compounding um, time period? Well, um, as an example, and I saw that number the other day that said roughly it's the, the market value in the private last round of fundraising for Uber, $50 billion. Also, FedEx, the market cap at that particular point in time was $51 billion. So the net... Uh, market value of both those institutions is rough, let's call it the same. Um, I'm not sure which one would be a better investment. I, re I really am not. Um, so the notion that those two are purported to be the same, the FedEx number is, is, a, is a harder, more documentable number because if you wanted to pull out $5 billion of value from FedEx right now, you could do it on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. The Uber valuation is within the context of private markets and what people are saying it's worth and what people are funding. But if you owned $5 billion reportedly of Uber, that is not as liquid as, as what $5 billion worth of FedEx would be. So let's ha have some nuanced judgment about the fact that those are um, on top of one another. And I missed your question a little bit in the sense that, okay, so the fact that an Uber can come into being and get to $50 billion without us as the public ever having a chance at it, uh, does that mean that there won't be other things that we as public uh, participants do have? No. I mean, there'll be other things. 
So, so we didn't get Uber as, as just public market participants, but there are other things. And by the way, you don't need to catch uh, an Uber, which comes from nowhere and within a period of, what, less than a decade? is thought to have that sort of valuation. Uh, FedEx, by contrast, I think that started, what, in the 60s or 70s? So that's been 40 or 50 years in business. Well, anywhere along the line that you decided to buy FedEx, if you'd hung in there with it, you've probably earned a reasonably good return. And you've compounded it uh, over, a, over a long period of time. And going forward, with the world growing as it is, and packages moving around, uh, I mean, I know there are alternative delivery systems, Uber being one of them, drugs being one of them, they created, but I, I would be willing to bet you a beer anyway <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that 10 years from now, FedEx is still a pretty dramatically important and profitable and good earning uh, sort of thing. And, and again, it's not right or wrong, it's just in knowing who you are and, and how you do things and things that resonate with you. I am very content and happy, delighted, thrilled to compound my money at reasonable rates with something like FedEx and not bemoan the fact or have angst or be stirred up about the fact that I didn't get to invest in Uber. It's okay. You know? I, know how to do, I know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. So do what you do. Remember to make uh, the question is about uh, you learning from the greatest investments you did not make. Um, how do you go about that process? And how do you decide that there is no learning to be made even if you didn't make an investment? Or uh, how do you recognize the important traits? Believe me, yeah. when, when you didn't buy Berkshire at $384 a share like I did, <laughs> you think about that every day for the rest of your life. <laughs> And I have my partner, Steve Markell, to thank for the fact that by the time I joined Markell, it was $5,750. And then I did. <laughs> but it was because Steve twisted my arm to say, you idiot, go ahead and buy it. So kind of like uh, you know, Jerry Newman helped Ben Graham get over the hump with Geico, which just wasn't the way he was wired at the time. Uh, you know, you, it'll happen to you. And when it does, you will, you will know that lesson every day for the rest of your life. <laughs> Do you, did you, do you keep a track of companies that you're not investing in, but they were close to your investment decision, something like a gray area or something where you did not make an investment? Did, and do you revisit them after an year, after five years? Is that how it works? Uh, yes, not as formally as what you might uh, think, but I don't think you need to be formal about that. I think if you're paying attention, if you're involved in the financial markets and you're reading every day and you're thinking and you're exposed, uh, you know what, what's going on. And in fact, I'll tell you, one, here, so here's one change that I made. When I started out in the investment business in the Wall Street Journal every day, and they still do this every day, they have a list of stocks that are making a new high, and they have a list of stocks that are making a new low. And when I started out in the business every day, I looked first at the new low list. I think, what's on sale? What, what can we get a deal on here? And I really didn't even look at the new high list because I figured you know, if I own something and it was making a new high, I knew that. I didn't, I didn't need it to be on a list to tell me that. I knew it because I'd already, already owned it. These days, I look at the new high list first and then the new low list. Because if there's something on the new high list, there might be a reason. might be a good reason. And, and, I'm, and if I don't own it and I see it making a new high, I'm more inclined to look at that and say, what does the market know that I don't know? And is this a really good company? And is what they're doing likely to make it such that next year and the year after that and five years after that and 10 years after that, they'd be more likely to be making new highs than, than new lows. It's a very gross distinction, but I found it to be tremendously effective in pushing me more towards better quality companies and better investments that, that uh, compound over time. And as Charlie Munger said, you know, time is the friend of a wonderful business and the enemy of a mediocre one. Um, and that is one technique that I use to help find good businesses and wonderful businesses rather than mediocre businesses. How does Google do in, according to your investing criterion? So I mean, all of us are pretty exposed to it. Because we, a lot of us get stock vesting. So interested to hear your opinion. And, and tell me your question again. 
how does Google do according to your investing criteria? Um, well, be candid. I, I, I own some Google, and I don't own a lot, and it's one of those things that I feel as I've missed, and I, and I feel stupid about that because you know I use it. I've, I mean, I'm on Google 20 times a day, and, and how could I have missed this? And, and the thing that uh, was the most challenging for me and remains the most challenging to me is uh, you know, how, the, how the compensation at senior levels works and what uh, this company intends to accomplish for its shareholders at the same time that they're trying to accomplish these things in the world. And, and I don't know the answer to that. And I'm not, I'm not skilled at discerning that. I'm not a good investor in this part of the world. I mean, I'm, I'm just, it doesn't match up to my, to my skill set as well. And I'm trying to get better. That's one of those things that I'm trying to learn. And that's one of the fun things about investing is things you don't know, you should learn something about. <laughs> so it's not boring. It's not like, uh, you know, I learned something when I was in school and now I'm done. Uh, it's, it's, it's a nice life challenge. And, and Google is something that, um, as I say, I own some of. And a friend of mine has an expression. They call it when they buy a little bit of something. And I do this, they're, they're buying a library card. <laughs> so it, one of the reasons I buy some of something is to make myself think more deeply about it and read the reports and just uh, be more aware of something. And I always find it's like a, if you, and, and Sarah and I were talking about sports and you were talking about you know, American sports and whatnot. And I hadn't thought of this until just now. Uh, and trying to trying to sort of connect with the the culture of sports. If you're not if you didn't grow up playing the sports, well, I know immediately if I was going to go to India and live there, and there was cricket that was this national sport that everybody was consumed by, but I didn't know a thing about it. What I would do is bet money on a cricket match, <laughs> <laughs> and and it's just it's kind of the way I'm wired. Because if I put twenty dollars down on something, well, I want to know who the players are, and who's better, and you know how, what their records were, and all that all that kind of stuff. So I do that sometimes. I will buy uh, positions in stock to make myself think about it in the same way that I'll bet twenty dollars on a ball game just so I have some rooting interest when the you know when the Oakland Raiders play the the uh, Tennessee Titans. I don't care who wins that. But if I'm having a party and I'm going to drink a few beers, and I'll bet $20 on one side or the other just so that I'll have somebody to root for and, and do a little work on it. In the analogy to, uh, to Berthon Hathaway and Warren Buffett, do you think like as Macau, uh, Macau in, uh, grows, you feel like the size would be a, like a, a, a barrier or a obstacle for your investment? For example, the last thing, big uh, acquisition you guys have and uh, you have a lot of fixed income right now. So if you're going to uh, increase your uh, equity investment to the level you had before, then there will be a lot of uh, you know, uh, investment you need to make. So do you think uh, size eventually will become uh, like a, a problem? Well, not problem, but like <laughs> a factor consideration. I will, I will try as hard as I possibly know how to, to make that a problem for us. <laughs> Yeah, so over, over time, that, that's our goal, to have those kind of problems, because that means things will have gone very, very well. Uh, and that's a very high class problem to have, to try to figure out how to invest uh, the flows of capital that are, that are coming in the door. So we started out with a little bit. It has grown to more. And we will try to make it grow to, uh, to more, so we're faced with trying to handle that problem. So with that, with that uh, you know, thank you so much for coming here. It's been a pleasure to listen to you. And we hope to have you visit again soon. <laughs> Thank you very much.